thanks everyone for coming. Uh, appreciate you all coming, dealing with the traffic, nice weather, etc. So my name's Rob. I organize Idea at IPO. We've been doing events in Silicon Valley for many years. We hold multiple events from San Jose to San Francisco. So we have a busy, busy calendar of events. So feel free to go to our website and check out our event schedule. It's ideatipo.com. We launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 60,000 members among all our meetup groups in the Bay Area. We've completed over 1,785 events. We're the most active, most prolific startup event organization in Silicon Valley, bar none. Thank you. Thank you, I think. Thank you. Uh, our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. So we have many, many partners to help us do what we do. Law firms, venture capital firms, angel investor groups, incubators, accelerators, colleges, universities, lots of other players in Silicon Valley. Tonight, we're grateful to Inlow Spring for hosting us at this beautiful venue. So I'd like to have Non from Inlow Spring come up and say a few words. So let's hear it for uh, Non and Inlow Spring. Applause. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming tonight. Oh, thank you for coming tonight. Uh, my name is Nan. Our company, Inlow Spring, uh, is, a technolo is a technology incubator and uh, venture capital. Uh, oh, I forgot to. Uh, it's our big pleasure to provide such, uh, our space for such a great event. And in the past five years, we have already invested in over 70 companies. And we also provide space for new and coming companies. And just feel free to grab brochures. And uh, or you can visit us online at www.inosereneus.com. Thank you. So our mission is to promote entrepreneurship, support entrepreneurs, build community, and provide value in the Silicon Valley startup ecosystem. So we provide content that's practical, actionable, and relevant, stuff that you can actually use to succeed as entrepreneurs. And we believe in building community because Silicon Valley attracts people from all over the world who come here to do great things. Who here is not originally from Silicon Valley? Who here was born and raised in Silicon Valley? Wow, three, that's awesome. So whether you're born and raised here or just arrived last night, we want to provide multiple channels for you to meet people, build relationships, and grow your network. And with regard to value, we want to make sure our events are affordable. And at each and every one of our events, we provide a delicious buffet meal. Is this a delicious buffet meal? Five people think it's a delicious buffet. Anyway, uh, I'd like to thank the sponsor of that delicious buffet meal, and that's Royce Law Firm. So here, let's hear it for Royce Law Firm. That's Royce Law Firm right there, by the way. So uh, here's the program for the rest of the evening. Our presenter will present uh, slides. He'll take no questions until about 8 o'clock. From 8 to 8.30, we'll open up to audience questions. Uh, we'd like to have a little line form here for the questions, and we'll take questions until about 30 p.m. We videotape many of our events because our mission is not just to help entrepreneurs here in Silicon Valley, but to democratize entrepreneurship and innovation all around the world. So to that end, we have a robust YouTube channel, youtube.com slash idea to IPO. So check it out. We have tons of videos, and we've documented and archived many, many of our events. And this rich, valuable content is available on demand, anytime, anywhere, totally free of charge. Whether you're in Palo Alto, Maui, Moscow, or Timbuktu. Our partner in this endeavor is Tim Jeggers of Jeggers Films, one of the top professional videographers in Silicon Valley. So uh, let's hear it for Tim. I'd like to have him say a few words. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Rob. Thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, I'm Tim. I do the YouTube videos for ID to IPO. You can find them uh, at the website, like he told you, youtube.com forward slash idea to IPO. I got started doing uh, weddings, and now I'm doing corporate events, uh, 
events are kind of my specialty. I also do product demos, Kickstarter videos. I do stuff with law firms, real estate companies, uh, individuals, and a lot of unique people all around the Bay Area. So if you have any questions about what I do or how to get access to the content that me and Rob have been collaborating on the last couple of years, feel free to ask me. I'll be around all night. Thank you. All right, we'll go right into our formal program. So by the way, although we have a formal program, it's very informal. So if you need to get up and get more food, help yourself, you can use the restrooms around the corner. And uh, we'll go all the way to late 30 p.m. At that point, we'll end the formal program. You can stick around for networking. And as a courtesy to Inland Spring, we'd like to leave the building by 9 p.m. Our featured speaker tonight is one of the top corporate attorneys in Silicon Valley. He's a, uh, well, he's the founder of Royce Law Firm. And actually, he's an iconic figure. He's everywhere in Silicon Valley. He speaks at meetups, conferences. You'll see him at social events. Uh, he's everywhere. He's Roger Royce. Let's give it up for Roger. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, all of you, for being out here tonight. I'm going to start with the disclaimer because I am a lawyer. So, but let me tell you a story before we get going. Tonight we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about the law, okay? <clears throat> talk about the law of ICOs, tokens, cryptocurrency. So, a long time ago, uh, when I was uh, in law school, right before class started, remember I was, it was a hot August day, and I was driving through this little town in Nebraska. I was on my way to Texas to go visit this girl I used to know. And I was sitting at a stoplight. And this police car pulls up alongside me with two men inside, and they arrested me for speeding. And I said, well, this doesn't sound very fair, you know. And he says, well, you can pay the fine, or you can hang around until the sheriff shows up, and you can talk with him about the law. And I said, well, I'm going to wait for the sheriff. I wouldn't speed in. I was sitting at a stoplight. I said, fine. So I sat in jail for a day or two. Finally, the sheriff came up, and I remember he says, so where's that guy that thinks that this is Indianapolis? And I said, oh boy, this is not going to go well. And we had a little talk about the law. And then he found me all the money I had in my pocket. And then I went on my way. So I'm not going to talk to you then about fairness. Certainly not going to talk about justice. <laughs> We're going to talk about is the law. And here in libertarian Silicon Valley, a lot of people view what the regulators do to blockchain folks kind of what that sheriff did to me in Nebraska many years ago. So I'm going to break this down into a handful of different things, but mostly I'm focusing on the regulatory agencies uh, and how they treat things. I'll try not to bore you to death, but this is a little dry, so you're going to have to hang with me on a lot of this. So uh, let's start with, with cryptocurrency. And I can think off the bat of four agencies we have. To, and by the way, the slides, if you'd like them, just send me an email. I'm happy to share these slides with you, whoever wants to see them. And you'll also find them on our website. Uh, you'll find them um, uh, on SlideShare, on LinkedIn. And by the way, by way of introduction, by the way, so our law firm, we're a Silicon Valley firm. We're based in Menlo Park. We have offices in um, uh, San Francisco, a couple of them in Southern California. We have branches in New York, D.C., Beijing, Shanghai, looking at Singapore because of this. So um, we do this stuff all over the world, and FinTech is one of the big three areas that we get very involved in. And for the last year, it's about all that I really want to, anyone wants to hear about. And I get at least three white papers a day from all over the world, people wanting to do ICOs or do some sort of blockchain project. So I've seen a lot of this, and I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, and um, I'm not a technical person, I'm a legal person, so I usually can just advise not on whether you got a good idea, a good market, but really on, on whether you can get there from here. So SEC, they loom large, probably largest in all this, because the first question we have to answer with all of these is whether we're dealing with a security. Uh, IRS, this is a sleeper. I'm going to talk more about this in a minute. This is something people don't think enough about until it's too late. And I've seen some very successful ICOs come into my office, and I have to give them the bad news about the tax company because of the way they set their deal up, and they didn't even think about it. It's so counterintuitive to think you could be taxable on these proceeds in the U.S. 
CFTC, Commodities Futures Trading Commission. Uh, sometimes they get in the act. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But just generally, um, they these four agencies all have their own definition of virtual currency, and it's not necessarily the same. So, for example, uh, for CFTC, a, a commodity, uh, it, it's a commodity, certainly, but they don't regulate it if it's what they call a spot trade. They only regulate futures trading. Uh, so it's a little bit confusing. For IRS, they view it as property, but they also view it as a commodity because property com commodities are property. And then finally, FinCEN, which regulates money services businesses. Let's drill down a little bit. So first, I want to talk about the tax side. Um, because I'm primarily a tax lawyer. That's how I got into this, and that's how I started out. And um, it's not on the slide. It will be on the next version. But how does the IRS tax us? And let's talk about crypto. We're still talking about crypto. I want to go crypto, blockchain, ICOs. Cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin, Ripple, all of this stuff. The IRS a few years ago finally ruled on this, and they could have gone a couple of different ways because people were trading this stuff. If it's a currency, that's a pretty good result because whenever you buy something with a U.S. currency, you don't have a taxable gain or loss. In tax language, that means your basis is equal to value, right? So if I give you a dollar, even though when I, I've held that dollar, dollar for 20 years, you know, and it's worth something different than when I first got it, I don't have a gain or loss on that transaction. That's currency. That's not how the IRS treats Bitcoin or cryptocurrency. They treat it as property. So if I give you, if I pay you in Bitcoin, I basically just exchange property. And exchanges are generally taxable, right? If I, you know what, early in my career, I used to practice in Fargo, North Dakota. I had a guy pay me in chickens once, right? It's, it's kind of the same thing. You pay, it's like paying someone in chickens, you know, and you pay him in Bitcoin. You know, whatever you paid for, for that cryptocurrency, uh, that's your cost basis. Whatever it's worth when you trade it, that's, there's a case called Arrowhead that says that's what you've received in exchange. That's the gain that you've realized in that transaction. And now, after January 1, you've recognized. Now, can anybody think of a way that that transaction might not be taxable? I'll give you a hint. This was true up until the end of last year. People were taking the position, including me, that that could be a like-kind exchange if we trade it one crypto for another. If I bought Ethereum with my Bitcoin, that was a good like-kind exchange. And a lot of people were taking that position. Uh, so we have to wait till the end for questions. Um, and I think that was a pretty safe position, but the law all changed on January 1 with the uh, tax, what used to be the, the, the law, for, the bill formerly known as the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act. Uh, effective January 1 of this year, changed all that. So there is no like-kind exchange for Bitcoin, crypto, Ethereum. It only applies to real estate. So that means whenever somebody trades um, uh, cryptocurrency for anything, they're going to have a taxable transaction. Now, let's think about that for a minute. I have a Coinbase account. Uh, and I, for a while there, I sit there and watch that account. Kind of reminds me of the dot-com days when all of us became day traders, <laughs> and we didn't get any work done because we sat and watched, you know, our our stocks on, on on the public markets all day long. Well, every time you trade on Coinbase, you've got a taxable transaction. Well, a lot of people didn't know that. They didn't believe it. They didn't understand it. Um, but the IRS figured out, well, here's a honeypot of data. Hey, how many How many data scientists in the room? technical people, data people. You know the term honeypot, right? That's what that was, of data. Here's all these people trading. We're just going to subpoena all the Coinbase records and figure out who's been not paying their taxes and reporting their taxes. So they did that. Um, and then there was litigation, and there was eventually a settlement. Yeah, there it is. So the IRS has got information on any account with at least $20,000 in any one transaction. This is not new news. This has been out, you know, for, for, for a couple of years now, for at least at least a year. It's been a long time. And it is a hundred percent certainty that they are going to be coming after all of those people. 
is just a computer program, right? It's right there. They've got the information. And if those taxpayers didn't pay their tax, they're going to get assessed a penalty. Now, I've been getting a lot of calls about that because by this time, everybody should know about this. As soon as you heard about this, you know, we all should have run in, you know, and amended our tax returns and, you know, got ahead of the services action. Uh, a few people didn't. And as you know, a lot of people made a lot of money in this business. You know, Bitcoin, you know, I used to practice law out in the oil field, and I remember whatever crazy story you heard in the oil field about people getting rich quick, someone had a crazier one. This reminds me of that. Like every story I hear about somebody who is undeserving, who made tons of money, I hear an even crazier one. And this is the same way. I've got I have a high school kids walking into my office, you know, with tens of millions of dollars they made on Bitcoin. It's insane. So some people, if they have not reported that as income, um, they're kind of a sitting duck waiting for the service. And the smart ones now, well, the smart ones, they, they corrected this long ago. The, uh, the, you know, the people who are becoming smart, I figured that out, and they're coming to me saying, what can we do? So I'll tell you what you can do. There's a couple of different ways you can go. And I just want to mention this. I won't belabor it, but it's so important. I want to get it out there. There's, a, there's what they call a quiet disclosure. You just go file the returns, amend your past returns. You hope nobody notices. Maybe you get a 20% underpayment penalty, uh, but you hope you don't go to jail. Uh, you do what they call the voluntary disclosure program. Um, and there's an offshore voluntary disclosure program for foreign bank accounts where the service will reduce the penalties uh, if somebody comes to them voluntarily and pays a reduced penalty and comes clean. So there are a couple, and then there's a streamlined version of that if, the, if it was an inadvertent or non-willful uh, mistake. That, that applies to foreign accounts, but it could protect crypto. So it's something that people ought to look into. They haven't been reporting this. And I don't want to spend the whole night talking about tax compliance, but I get so many questions about this, it's worth mentioning. Oh, the last thing I'll say before we get off of, of uh, the tax stuff is in these ICOs, um, or, or even, even outside of, I haven't defined ICO yet. So let's say you have a transaction where somebody performs some service and they, they get some cryptocurrency. Taxable. It's taxable at ordinary rates to them because it's, in, it's, it's compensation. Put a pin in that. I'm going to come back to that when we get to ICOs. Okay. So cryptocurrency, we don't have slides on this yet, but it's based on uh, blockchain technology, right? It basically is a smart contract. And we've got uh, tokens now, which are also, in essence, smart contracts, digital coupons um, that uh, companies are using uh, to uh, facilitate certain types of utility. So let me kind of, and I know a lot of you here know this area extremely well, so we're going to have to take a step back. Let's all get on the same page, because there's all those people in the audience who, who have, haven't heard about this before. And the way I like to think about it is think of your American Airlines mileage, right? Really, that's a token. It's probably the first token. It's the best example. Everybody understands that. They earn these rewards miles, these frequent flyer miles. Now they can use them, right, to get additional, to get additional miles. It's a token. That's a great way to analyze these things, but it only goes so far. And I'll tell you why when we get to the securities in a minute. But that's a good example. Here's another example. One that makes more sense to me. Imagine you go to the county fair and you walk in and uh, there's this, you know, and, and the first thing you do is you buy a bunch of tickets because they don't want the guy selling the beer, handling the money, right? They need to know you're over 21. So you get a bunch of these red beer tickets and you go over to where they're selling the beer and you hand them a ticket, a beer coupon, and they give you a beer. It's a token, right? Now think of that in the digital world. So that's, that's what we mean. That's about where the similarity ends. Because if you take my example, to, to get what's going on in the digital world, you have to go one step further and say, well, suppose there's not enough beer coupons to buy all the beer that there is, right? And suppose we run out of them. Well, and suppose then somebody sets up an exchange where they can buy and sell these, like StubHub, buy and sell these coupons. And suppose me, you know, the guy selling the beer, I market it that way and say, here, 
buy some beer tickets. They're going to go way up in value because I'm going to make sure the supply is really limited. That's a better analogy to what's actually going on in the market. That's why the SEC is involved, okay? We'll get to that in a minute. Well, we'll get to it right now. That's why Jay Clayton, the uh, acting SEC chairman, has said that he's never seen an ICO that isn't a security. Now, what's an ICO? An ICO, initial coin offering, and what it typically is is a company, let's say they have a product, um, and rather than sell the product, they sell a token, a right to access to the product. That's utility, right? Um, let me think of some, you know, I hate... <laughs> Like I said, I see about three of these a day, and I'm trying not to give away anybody's business model. But let's suppose that my product is some sort of software, some digital software product that's really valuable. It's a security solution, we'll say. You buy the token, you get access to the software. So far, so good. Sounds like pure utility. Uh, but then you expect that the value of that's going to go up because the value of the software is going to increase. And you expect that you're going to be able to market those tokens on Binance or some exchange because the value is going up and people want them. So there's a secondary market in these tokens, right? So that's the thing that has caused Secretary Clayton to say, I've never seen an ICO that isn't a security. I've never seen one of these tokens that is not a security. Why is that significant? Because if it is a security, it's subject to our securities laws, US and federal. And they will shut down most of these deals in the United States. Right? If it's not a security, it's not subject to our securities laws. It's just utility. It's just those frequent flyer miles. Right? You don't ask somebody if they're accredited before you give them frequent flyer miles. Not a security. So the trouble is the way these tokens are used. They're used by companies to raise money, like a substitute for a capital raising activity, uh, and they're purchased by people as an investment, more than just a store of value. And uh, it used to be almost everybody who walked into my office, they said, oh, our token's a utility token, not a security token, because we're going to call it that. You know, and it doesn't really work that way. Uh, the way it works is you run through these tests, and everybody now knows what the Howey test is. I mean, you know, the, the four-year-old girls, you know, in Palo Alto know what the Howey test is. It's just everyone's heard of this. But that's not the end of it. That's just one test. And that's the idea that something is a security uh, if you're making your money off the efforts of somebody else, right? Like stock. Think about stock. You're making money off someone else's efforts. It's very passive. The managerial efforts of somebody else. Um, there's the family resemblance test, which has been applied in a case, uh, to, uh, a case involving promissory notes. Um, which really has more to do with whether it looks like an investment. It's a you know, quack like a duck test. And this risk capital test. The idea that the investors are risking capital uh, because they're expecting to get some sort of benefit. Now think about how far this goes. And this is what they do in California for state law, by the way. This was a California case, this country club, country club case. Country club goes out and sells membership interest uses the proceeds of the membership interest to build a facility. Court says that's a security under this rule. It's a very broad definition. So my approach on this is to treat all of these as securities. Almost always. Almost always. I do that even when I see a legal opinion that says it's not. And I've seen a lot of legal opinions that say they're not. But I just don't believe it. I think the SEC is going to take a different is going to take a different approach. Now, why do we care? If it's a security, what if you're wrong? What if you say, I think it's utility? Well, um, the SEC has really been ramping up enforcement efforts in this area. Uh, the Dow, took, well, first of all, they got two different units uh, within the SEC uh, that are devoted to blockchain um, <clears throat> enforcement. So they're devoting a lot of uh, resources to this effort. The Dow token is one that everybody heard about. That's where the SEC first um, uh, had an enforcement action uh, uh, with respect to a token. But this one, these were really bad facts. We have a saying in the law that bad facts make bad law. And these were really bad facts. Uh, this thing looked a lot like buying shares in a company. And the fact that they got hacked and people lost their money didn't help. Drew a lot of attention to them. Okay. 
Munchie is a little more interesting uh, because that looked like you know it was a it was a token uh, it was a rewards based token that you know focused around restaurant meal reviews. Um, it looked like there was a lot of utility in that. But the SEC said, no, people are buying these things uh, with the expectation of profiting from them. So it's a security. So that was a cease and desist order in that one, actually. So the bigger problem, and we all talk about the big bad SEC and what they'll do, you know, when they get a hold of you. Practical matter, what I've been seeing is they, they've been pretty restrained, right? This is Donald Trump's SEC. They have not been out really looking for bloody shirts except in the extreme cases where there's fraud, there's, uh, you know, like the Dow, people marketing these things as if they were a security, which is what they were doing in Dow, where people are losing money. You know, they've, you know, they've actually been relatively restrained. Um, the real fear I have in these, and this I have experienced with my clients personally, is that they're going to get sued under the private rights of action that arise under these laws. In other words, not only can the government come and penalize these companies for not following the law, private investors can get their money back, right? So if the, if, if, if the, uh, if the project tanks, which about 80% of them are, by the way, about 80% of these things have not returned money to their investors so far. We, you know, don't get freaked out by that. That's kind of just startup company economics. <laughs> you know, pretty much all startups are like that. But it means they're very high risk. Very high risk. A lot of people are necessarily, by definition, going to lose some money. You know, probably lose money in the first nine and hit a home run on the tenth. Well, that means they can come and get their money back, and the people who promoted it are going to be personally responsible. That's the real fear in this. That's why it, we have to be so careful. So my approach in these things is, um, look, even though I believe you, I trust you 100%. You know, it's a utility. God bless you. Let's just Humor me and comply with the securities laws, right? We're going to do like a protective securities compliance. That's how I always used to do it. Uh, let me come back to that slide because um, we've got a really good reason for doing it now. And uh, that is, where is it? This letter right here. Uh, no, not that letter. Oh, well, I'll come to it later. But the real reason, the biggest reason, is because FinCEN has said, remember FinCEN? They um, regulate money services businesses. They have said, look, if your token really is a utility token, and it's not subject to regulation by the SEC, welcome to our world. You're subject to regulation as a money services business. If it really is utility, it's not securities, then that means... Uh, that that's just another cryptocurrency, and we are going to regulate it. And that means you got to register as a money services business. You have to have a very robust anti-money laundering policy and know your customer policy in place. And then the states are going to piggyback on that. And then in, in, in most states, you're going to have to register as money services business. It's it's very onerous, very onerous. You would you would much rather be regulated by the SEC than FinCEN if you have your choice. All right, so now I've got another reason for wanting to comply with the securities laws. So what are the securities laws that we can comply with? How can we make these things work? Number one, 506B. That's an offering to accredited individuals only. An accredited person is somebody who is rich under 1933 standards. Because that's when we got that definition. It's only changed a little since then. Uh, it means somebody who has a, it's either worth or net income, uh, test either a net worth of a million dollars, at least a million dollars, excluding personal residents, or net income of two hundred thousand dollars a year, three hundred thousand jointly for the current year and the previous two years. If you meet that definition, uh, then you're accredited and you're good under these laws. You know, a sale to that person you just have to, just have to comply with anti-fraud rules and disclosure requirements, but. Um, it's a 506B exemption from registration. So just to back up a minute, every sale of a security either has to be registered or exempt for federal purposes. And here in California, it's got to be qualified or exempt. 
you, we just can't register tokens. Okay, I'll just, it's, it's a long story. People talk about doing it. People say they have ways of getting around some of these rules, but trust me, you just, you don't have the time. You know, it's clunky. The laws for register, registration of securities were designed for stock, not tokens. And I don't know that anybody's successfully done it yet. So it's not really an option. It's not practical. So we're looking for an exemption from registration. 506B is the first exemption. You've sold everything to rich people. That's the exemption. It's a private offering to only accredited individuals. 506C we got about five years ago, 2012, six years ago. And 506C loosened up that rule. It said, you know what? 506B says you sold only to rich people and you didn't advertise or solicit. 506C says, well, tell you what. You can advertise, provide it, that you verify that all of your investors are accredited. That's 506C. We use that a lot these days. It's huge. It, it opened up capital markets like you wouldn't believe. I mean, it, it really resulted in a flood of new money going into startup companies. And now it's being used for tokens. Um, and as an example, think of the big crowd financing sites, crowdfunding sites, right? F Funders Club, Angel List, uh, all of those big ones. Uh, they all have a portal that allows them to use 506C. So companies here in Silicon Valley can advertise and get an investor, an angel investor from Oklahoma. Never do that before. So for the past six years, we've had this. We can use that for tokens. Reg A plus is gaining some uh, interest. And what that is, is it, it also came in with the Jobs Act in 2012. And under Reg A plus, a company can make an offering of up to $50 million, okay? And you do like a little mini IPO, right? It's not as onerous as, as an IPO. It's like a mini IPO. You still need financials. You still need to meet certain requirements, but it's being used quite a bit for these sorts of offerings uh, because it's not quite, for example, you don't need the, uh, you know, the, the bank escrow agent and all the things that make, make token offerings so problematic. Start Engine down in LA is doing these. They're doing their deals as Reg A plus deals. Um, they are a little time consuming. You're going to spend at least four months getting these things done. They're very expensive because I said a mini IPO, not a non IPO. So you do have a registration requirement with the SEC. Plan on spending a couple hundred thousand dollars in legal fees um, to get it done. But that's something that's become kind of popular. The benefit of it is you can sell your tokens to non-accredited U.S. persons, right? Remember what I said about the top two? A pointer on this thing? Green one? Okay. That's accredited only. That's accredited only. This one, accredited, non-accredited, widows, orphans. You, know, you can take money from all those people that you want to. Okay. Reg S, this is the exemption we use most often. And what that means, it's foreign targeted. We geofence, everyone know what geofence is? You can all guess. We geofence the offerings so US persons can't buy any. And we target these securities at only foreign persons. That's where I guess. The US securities laws are concerned with protecting US individuals, right? US persons. They're not concerned with protecting foreign persons. So we have reg S. By the way, I was on a panel about a month ago, and uh, there was an investor kind of guy in the panel, and he made that comment. And he says, well, you know, the U.S. securities laws are designed to help facilitate the creation of capital. I said, boy, not in my world. That's not what they're trying to do. It's just the opposite, if you ask me. It's really to protect the investors. Uh, Non-U.S. offering, this is where we keep everything. So with Reg S, you've got a U.S. issuer, but a foreign offering. Non-U.S. offering, we've got a non-U.S. issuer, right? My Singapore Foundation, for example. Well, I heard Malta is getting popular now. Switzerland has been. The U.K. has been a big place to go to. But everything is non-U.S. And then that one we talked about, the actual registration statement. Haven't seen one that works yet, although I've heard some theories as to how to make it work. If anybody want, is curious, I'll tell you about it. Okay, I think we talked about this. I don't want to spend too much time on it. So, what is this initial coin offering I've been talking about? Now that you got the law, now that we've talked about the law, let's talk about how we're going to apply it. 
And there have been a lot of ICOs done. This is a real thing. This has really taken off. Uh, it is very disruptive, and a lot of people think this is going to disrupt the venture capital industry. I don't know if I'd go that far. Uh, but I will say that I heard that about crowdfunding, too, and that didn't really happen either. But I will say that it is another source of funds that a lot of folks are taking advantage of. And I think if you do this properly, this could be a good strategy for the right company. Like I say, I see about three white papers a day. Um, most of them, I just don't think they've, it, it just doesn't feel right, doesn't make sense. Some things just lend themselves to tokenization, right? For example, if you're a game company, if you've got an online game, people are kind of used to using tokens in the game already. They're used to buying virtual swords or whatever. Right? So that one, it kind of makes sense that you would create a market for those tokens. I like online game companies. I mean, those are naturals. Um, other companies, not so much. Um, I'll tell you another, uh, another bad candidate is if you do not yet have a business, then I'm a little worried you know, that you might be forcing it a little too much. But say you've got a business, you've got a software product, it's out there in the market, and people are already excited about it, you might have something that lends itself to being tokenized. Okay, uh, so here's how it works. Okay, we went through these rules, I'm going to get back into it. Um, here is the ICO as a way to raise money. Um, so step number one, we've got our company, our issuer, and I'm going to drill down into some details in a minute, but big picture. Um, issuer needs to raise some money to build out the platform. So what we usually do is we do what we call a pre-sale. And the market has come along and come up with an instrument called a SAFT, Simple Agreement for Future Token, based on what we used to use in the equity world called a SAFE, Simple Agreement for Future Equity, based on what we did even before that called a warrant <laughs> for convertible debt with warrants attached to it. Uh, so now it's a SAFT, and what it is, is we go to our investors, usually a small number of accredited investors, so we can rely on that 506 Reg D exemption. It's really easy to get. So we go to those accredited investors, and we sell them these SAFTs, and we say, look, Mr. Investor, what you get is this instrument. This instrument entitles you to our tokens after we create them, after we de develop them with the money that you're giving us to build the platform. When we do our token sale, you get to exchange this SAF for tokens, and you get them at a really super low price because you were smart enough to get into this deal early, and you saw the future. So, you, so we do a lot of these SAF deals. And that's something that I will tell you from experience that U.S. accredited investors are just eating up. Just, I'm just seeing tons of these being placed, even institutions, right? Institutions that were so wary of cryptocurrency, um, I'm seeing a lot of them get into these things. All right, so now we got the money from the SAF. We raised our first, I don't know, million dollars or whatever it is. We take that money and we go out and we build out the software platform. We build out the token. We get our team in place. Where's our team? Legal, tax, foreign legal, because there's always a foreign component. Compliance people, marketing. Right? You need a good token marketing person. This is super important. Know your customer, anti-money laundering. If you mess this up, the SEC and FinCEN will be all over you. This has really got to, and every foreign jurisdiction I've dealt with is concerned about anti-money laundering as well. Economic, I should say economics, token economics. Uh, I like to see somebody involved in a deal who understands token economics. It's arcane, it's tricky. Um, you really got to model this out properly. And of course, you got to have your techies, you know, who can do out, go out and do the software. The token should have some utility. I mean, it doesn't have to, but if it doesn't, then why aren't you just selling stock? Um, so these tokens have some utility. Uh, what's it going to be used for, right? Are you going to have voting rights? Is it democratized? And then we get into the legal issues. Before I get to that, this is the first time I've said this secondary trading, and that comes down to the third step. So we do our offering, our token offering. We develop it. We sell it in the ICO. And the third step is these investors, of course, down the road, they're going to want to get some liquidity. Okay, those are the three steps. Now, um, 
first issue is the regulatory securities tax, FinCEN, CFTC, plus a whole bunch of other things. So here's how a typical deal might be set up. They're not all like this, and, um, but this is how I've done a lot of them. So we've got our US platform company. It's done the SAF, it's built out the platform. A lot of these will be done through a foreign jurisdiction because remember what I said, I can't think of a way to get unaccredited individuals in the US into these deals. So we'll do a foreign offering. So we have accredited individuals uh, into the SAF, and we have non-accredited foreigners, accredited or non-accredited, into the token itself in the ICO. And we'll do that through a foreign jurisdiction. Singapore is pretty popular. Um, Switzerland is popular. Like I say, I was just reading about Malta the other day. I got something in the mail about Cyprus. There's a lot of, I've, I've done one through Seychelles. So there's a lot of places you could go. Uh, I'm seeing a lot of these go directly to Cayman. Uh, this is a structure that the Cayman lawyers tell me they like because the AML compliance is a little easier under this. But it's something like this. In this particular structure, the Singapore Foundation did the ICO. Um, the money went into a Cayman company, uh, which then made a transfer pricing payment, payment to the US platform company, which actually provided the utility to the user. Does that make sense? Did I mean? <laughs> okay, let me say that again. So this US platform company, let's say this token has some utility. You can buy a sword in a game with it. All right, we built the game, we own it, right? We, you know, built the whole thing out. This company does an ICO, it raises millions and millions of dollars. The money, I want to run it through Cayman for some tax reasons that I'll talk about in a minute. But then it gets paid back to the US platform company to pay for all of its costs in providing the service. It's revenue, right? We're just making tons of revenue here. And the token holder, they have the right to use the service that US platform company is providing. And later, they're going to be able to sell those tokens. Now, um, there's a way you can do a reg D and reg S deal at the same time. It's a little tricky, but a lot of these are being done that way. But for the most part, you know, this is foreign and this is US as I've been setting it up. Okay, I wanna make sure everyone's clear on that before I move on. That's the general idea. You've now got a Singapore entity or a Cayman entity um, and we've got these tokens issued. So a couple things I wanna drill down on before I go back to reg A. All right, before I get to exchanges. Um, I'm gonna talk about tax later. So for now, the regulatory issue. Remember what we said, if it's a security, it's gotta be exempt or registered. This sale here is exempt under Reg S or as a foreign target or as a foreign offering, a foreign security, non-US non offering rather. The sale here is accredited only. You complied with the securities laws. And what was the other one? FinCEN, right, money services business. Generally, if one agency has the right to regulate something, the other agency will back off. That's just generally true. Not always, not necessarily, but that's just the way FinCEN and the SEC are best friends. That's kind of how they work. So unless you're doing something that's obviously money services here, you probably don't worry about FinCEN. If, on the other hand, you have a token that's being traded for fiat, and fiat is cash, right, then you probably do. CFTC, that's the third one I mentioned, Commodities Futures Trading Corporation. When do they get involved? Not because this token is a commodity like grain or wheat or uh, gold. It is a lot like gold. But they get involved if you're trading in futures, options, contracts, stuff like that, swaps, derivatives. We don't have any of that going on here. So really, we've just got SEC, if we do this correctly, that we have to worry about. And I can handle the SEC. We've got very clear rules now, even though people say they're not so clear. You know, one last thing I'll say about this before I move on is be really careful. There's a standard emerging in the market. There's no, by the way, there is no market standard, but there are standards emerging. And one of the things I've been seeing pop up is a legal opinion that says you're a utility token, not a security token. Just remember everything I said. The SEC says they've never seen one. Yet there are opinions out there that say they exist. How can that be, right? Well, read those opinions carefully. It's not an insurance policy. You know, they're very, you know, it's a very iffy sort of thing. It's a risky thing to do, I think. 
because a lot of times what they'll do, these opinions, is they'll add up all the factors in one column that say you're a security, and all the factors in the other column that say you're not, and do kind of a weighing analysis. And I get that, I understand that, I can see why you would do that. There's no law that says that's the right approach. So you gotta be very kind of skeptical, or not skeptical, but cautious about relying too heavily on that. That's how I would do it. All right, now we finally get to the punchline of my whole talk, and that's the exchanges. Now I'm an investor. You've convinced me that your token is awesome, and I participated in your ICO, and I bought one on a foreign exchange. What do I do with this thing now? I don't even play video games, so I don't want the sword. What I want is I want to make some money in this. And you, you know, we kind of expected this would go up in value. How am I going to get liquidity out of my token? If it's a share of stock, I know how, right? I know how to sell a share of stock. I'll go list it on an exchange. I'll wait for you to go public, or I'll sell it to a private buyer. I don't know about these tokens. So under Reg D, um, resales are restricted. So usually to resell that to resell that token, you're going to have to deal with what they. Well, I don't want to get too deep into this, but what they call 144 restrictions. You have to hold it for a year, and then you can only sell it in a private sale unless it's listed on a registered exchange or this thing called alternative trading system. And the SEC has recently come out and they've said, well, gee, these platforms, as far as we're concerned, they're securities exchanges. So all these places where you list your token and you sell it to some stranger in another part of the world, and that creates a market value and keeps these things going up in value, that's an unregistered exchange, right? That's what the SEC is saying. And they've been lately, over the past month or longer, issuing subpoenas on all these ICOs. They're trying to find out who's doing these uh, unlawful secondary sales. So this is a problem. The solution to the problem is that there are several platforms now um, who are in the process of qualifying for one of these exemptions, either being a registered exchange, or a little easier, being an alternative trading system, which requires being a broker dealer and having some additional requirements. But if you're going to do this, you're gonna go this route. Right now, people are, it's like cannabis, you know, you're betting on a future change in the law. People are betting that at some point, you'll be able to get liquidity in a lawful way, because there will be exchanges. At this point, unless it's happened really recently, I don't know of any registered exchanges handling tokens. I know a lot of the platforms that say they're going to be registered exchanges and they've applied and, you know, and, and they've qualified for some foreign law, but you got to be really careful about this. But, and, and the careful part is telling your investors, telling the investors that what they're getting is not tradable, there's no market for it, and as far as their secondary trading, you're relying on the development of these exchanges. Now, I believe it's going to happen. It's going to happen very soon. This problem's going to be solved. Uh, the market believes it. Just look how much money is going into ICOs. Uh, where you would get in trouble on this if you didn't warn the widows and orphans you took your money from that there is no current exchange and they get in trouble you know, for listing on one of these unregistered exchanges. So this is something we're very careful about in our disclosures. Okay. CFTC, we talked about that. Um, every once in a while, this comes up, depending on the terms of your token, because sometimes people want a token that trades on futures or derivatives of some commodity. Um, <clears throat> be careful. Cryptocurrency is a commodity as far as CFTC is concerned, but it's not regulated unless, uh, unless you're trading in futures or derivatives. So we do work with crypto funds, for example. And you have to be careful because the way crypto funds work is they usually are going to do some trading in futures. Or you know what I mean by futures and derivatives, right? You're not trading on a spot transaction, the actual purchase and sale. You're trading against a future value through options and the contracts. And then you have to register. And CFTC, these rules are, are just really complicated. They're just, you know, it's a big mess trying to wade through them. What's a commodity pool operator? You know, it's, so you got to be a little careful about it. And then finally, uh, FinCEN, I do want to talk about, that's the agency that regulates the financial system. 
And um, if somebody is in a what they call a money services business, then you've got the weight of FinCEN on your back. Uh, that means registration. Uh, it means uh, money laundering policies, know your customer policies, record keeping, reporting requirements. Uh, FinCEN can be a very tough group to get along with. And here's the one big thing about this, because I get this a lot from companies. They say, well, gee, you know, Uber didn't ask anybody's permission when they started doing ride sharing. They just did it and changed the law later. And Airbnb didn't ask anybody's permission when they started doing, you know, house sharing. They just did it and asked permission later. You can do that. You can say that about almost any industry. This industry is different because if you make a mistake and you're Airbnb, you pay a fine. If you make a mistake and you're a money services business, you might go to jail. There are very serious criminal penalties uh, in securities law and in money in, um, in financial services. And if you don't believe me, I can introduce you to people who are sitting in jail right now who are about as uh, innocent and guileless as they come. You know, just honest mistakes. This is the letter I was talking about. It says FinCEN is sitting there, you know, just chomping at the bit, watering at the mouth, saying, okay, if you're a utility, you better come register with us. Right? We talked about this. This is the one where we say, look, you're way better off uh, being regulated by, um, by, the sec by SEC. Yeah, this last one is the most significant. These rules likely do not apply if the tokens are offered as securities and SEC has jurisdiction. And this is a big one, and you got good solid AML requirements. Or if it's a future and CFT, uh, CFTC applies, then FinCEN will leave you alone. If you're trying to get out of these two rules, then you're stuck with this one. So you're in one of these buckets. You know, you're in one of these buckets one way or another. Notice that they all talk about AML, anti money laundering. In fact, that's one of the things the SEC looks at as well. They want to know that every company has a good AML policy. Uh, that's of concern to every regulatory agency. Uh, and if, if you don't have that, that's one of the things that gets them interested. I want to mention that there is state regulation. Let's not forget about that. Um, wherever you, in any state you sell a security, you have to comply with the laws of that state. So if you are going to do one of these offerings, like say you do a Reg A plus offering that you can uh, offer to non-accredited individuals in the United States, or even a Reg D offering accredited in the United States, you still have to make sure you comply with every state. New York's the worst right now. They've got the BIT license, although I have not yet seen it apply to an ICO. It theoretically could, depending on how this thing is set up. And other states are, including even California, are looking at laws to regulate virtual currency. I didn't list here the states going the other way, but you've all heard about how Wyoming is being very friendly. They've passed laws uh, uh, basically totally exempting uh, tokens from their securities regulation. Doesn't mean it's exempt from federal, just means it's exempt from, from state. But it worked, because I have a lot of companies now that want to incorporate in Wyoming because they like the fact that the state's going to leave them alone. Uh, Puerto Rico's going to go that way too, you watch. A lot of my clients are moving to Puerto Rico because they're creating a blockchain community down there. Um, we'll see what California does. All right. In the last few minutes, I want to talk a little bit about tax. This, um, this is, <laughs> so I'm giving this talk to the American Bar Association tax section next month. It'll drive you crazy if I have to go through all this now. So let me just hit the high points. This is very technical. It is not well understood. Uh, honestly, most of the deals I've seen have missed this. But as a general rule, these proceeds are taxable. Okay, I'll just say it. One of these rules is going to catch them. Even if that money comes in through a foreign corporation, even if it comes in through a foreign foundation, one of these rules is likely to impose a US tax on that income. So we just need to bite the bullet on that model it out, and do some things that will minimize the amount of U.S. tax that you pay. And what you don't want to do, this one right here, uh, we, can, we can get the rate down to 10.5% uh, if, we, if we structure this correctly. 
I don't have a slide here yet, but if we can do everything through Puerto Rico, we can get the tax rate down to 4%. So if you think about it, you can minimize that. If you don't think about it, you're going to be, if I can find, oh, I don't have a slide. If you don't think about it, you're going to be at 37% federal plus state. Okay? If you have the typical structure, US person owns Singapore Corporation, Singapore Corporation does the ICO, the US person is going to pay 37% on that income. So this is something that requires a little bit of planning, and I've seen very little planning go into this so far. And by the way, the reason why is because these rules are relatively new. Uh, as of January 1, we got a whole new set of uh, international tax rules on top of the ones we had before, uh, which make it way worse than it used to be. Yeah, so I'll just pause. The tax vulnerability here, just to give you a little more um, background, is that the money going into the, so this, the problem is that the, we're worried about the income of the Swiss Foundation or Swiss Corporation uh, or whatever it is being taxed back to the some U.S. person over here, a founder. And that could happen as an alter ego, as an agent, or under one of these rules that we had talked about. What I'd rather do is have the money come in, be paid here, and then have a transfer pricing agreement at least allow us to time the receipt of the income. Because one of the things we want to do, we want to match deduction with income. You're spending that money on your platform. You want to get a deduction for that the same year that you have the income. And if you get some money out of it that's not, that you don't have a deduction to match it, be happy you got some money. And don't worry about the fact that you got a 10% tax rate on it. A couple of other interested agencies. How are we doing on time, Rob? Three minutes. Um, one I have to mention, so consumer protection, we always have to worry about false advertising. You probably read it in the news uh, a week or two ago, Taiwan ICO, $60 million, complete scam. Just took the money and disappeared, $60 million. They didn't even have a software product, just a complete Ponzi. It wasn't even a Ponzi. They weren't even paying anybody. They just raised as much as they could and disappeared. So um, you, as you can imagine, the regulators are very concerned about things like that. The one that might surprise you a little bit is that the FTC has gotten into the act. Why would that be? <laughs> well, I've had three celebrities call me now saying, hey, I'm going to get these tokens, and all I have to do is put my name you know, on this deal. Can I do that? I'm going to say this is the you know, so-and-so celebrity from Hollywood uh, ICO. The FTC has rules around that, right? And first of all, Number one, you know, under FTC rules, you can't endorse a product that you don't honestly use. You know? So do you really use you know, this company's swords, virtual swords, or whatever it is they're tokenizing? Because if you don't, you might run into a problem under that FTC rule. But the bigger thing is that it really, you know, it better be somebody who really kind of knows what they're talking about, knows what they're doing, because it just looks bad. It just looks bad to have a celebrity endorsement if, if the regulators just don't believe the celebrity knows what he's endorsing. So we've seen, and I've heard a lot of chatter about that from regulators talking about how they hate that. <laughs> so, so that's one last organization that can get involved. And then finally, um, industry-specific regulations. Uh, I've seen tokenization on top of an already regulated industry, and it's like exponentially more complex, right? It's like we already had a, we already were in the real estate business, which is complicated enough, you know, on, or, or agriculture. There's another good example. And now you got a token on top of that. So um, just keep in mind, just because the SEC is involved doesn't mean nobody else matters. You still got every other organization. Um, so agriculture comes to mind. Financial services is the one that really comes to mind. Because a lot of people are trying to tokenize uh, the financial services industries. And I'm not saying it can't be done. I'm just saying it's that much more complexity. OK, with that, I think we are ready to turn it back to Rob. Let's give it up for Roger. Well, that was some sustained applause there. Anyway, uh, we have half an hour for questions. We'd like to take as many questions as possible. So I'm going to do this very systematically. I'm going to go down each row. If someone has a question, we'll do it row by row. Hang on to the mic till you're done, because you may have a follow-up. Uh, row one, any questions? So assuming that uh, you have a company that's an established platform, you have an excellent case for tokenization, 
and uh, you want to do an ICO. What I didn't hear was, you know, we obviously can't set it up to work in the U.S. from non-accredited investors, but if we, we do have a large offshore component uh, that says does half our business overseas, so we could possibly set up and do a non-accredited sale from that entity, and then it's okay to transfer the money back to the U.S. company? Yeah, let me show you how. Well, in your scenario, who owns the platform? Uh, the, the U.S. company, and then the U.S. company also owns the wholly owned subsidiary in the other foreign country. Beautiful. That's what we want. We want it to come back. We'll even use the more complicated one. We want the money to come back through a transfer pricing agreement. So um, you'll do the, the token sale someplace offshore. Um, your pre-sale has been over here, presumably. There's, there's no restrictions on that from the government? Oh, well, there is. There, there is. Yeah. What you're doing is you're making a... So the money is going back into Cayman. So that's between two foreign corporations. We don't care about that as a U.S. matter. Uh, but now we got to get the money back into the U.S. That's what you're asking about. So we have a license and services agreement right here that says, hey, we're going to be paid for our trouble in creating this platform and providing this utility to these people over here who bought the token. That's how we get the money back in. Now, that's subject to U.S. transfer pricing rules. But transfer pricing rules under U.S. tax law, when you have transactions between related parties, and let's say this is a sub of, of this company or a brother sister, uh, the transaction has to be at arm's length meaning that it's what unrelated companies would price a transaction at acting at arm's length. So it can't be whatever number you come up with. It has to be pursuant you know, to this arm's length standard, which we generally prove through an economic study. So, and that's exactly how I want it to be, because I want the money to come back. And, I, and, and you get a little bit of wiggle room in these studies, and you get some wiggle room in structuring, because what I really don't want to have happen is you to trigger a loss here. That's, if you do that, then your tax person screwed up because losses are no longer, it used to be you could carry over net operating losses. So if you, if you had more expense of income in one year, well, you just took the difference, the extra loss that you couldn't deduct, you took it the next year. Well, now you can do that, but you can't carry 100% of it over. Right? We're limited under current law. So I want to match income and loss deduction as much as I can. Um, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to structure this so that we get to that point uh, under our transfer pricing rules. So the foreign subsidiary could then market to U.S. citizens and then return that cash back oh, to no, the no, U.S.? Oh, no, 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 no. You still can't do that. Still can't do that. No, you're not. You, you absolutely cannot market to U.S. citizens under, unless you're under one of, unless, you know, like I say, unless it's Reg A, Reg D, something like that. You, you know, there's the only way that I can see you sell to U.S. unaccredited individuals yes. is if you're in a Reg A offering. And if you are in a Reg A offering, you don't need this anymore. You might as well do the whole thing in the U.S. And how long does it take to set that up, soup to nut? Reg A? Reg A? Uh, probably four months, three, four months. It's because you, you know, you get, you got to submit documents to the SEC. They'll comment. You'll get comments back, that sort of thing. All right, let's roll any questions. Go for it. Thank you. Two questions. So, um, in your experience, the you said um, you know you do a pre-sale, there's a builder platform, and then do the ICO. What's the typical uh, time that the um, soft investors are willing to wait uh, before you get to the ICO because one of the things we've heard is that you know they want to go to the ICO as quickly as possible to you know for their to get the return on their on their investment. So what has been the uh, how, how long are investors willing to wait? It depends. Sorry, it it depends. I think it's all over the place. I mean, I've got some that have been. You know, they did their SAF months ago, you know, six months ago, and they're still working on it. On the other hand, I had one where it took like 30, 60 days, you know, because they just had that platform up really quickly. I think it just depends on what you're building. <laughs> depends on how complicated the utility is and the marketing and the, and the legal team. I, 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 
I can't give an answer. It's like, how long does it take to build a house? Right. Um, my second question was around the um, exchanges. You said that the, all the exchange, uh, exchanges are being uh, you know, submitting their application to the SEC and so forth. Does that apply to the exchanges that are foreign-based as well? Yeah, if they're foreign-based, then they are what we call the alternative trading platform, and they have to meet those requirements. So it's got to be, you know, it's got to be either a registered exchange or an ATP. It's a problem. I have a few questions. So, quick question about Reg A. Does that allow non-US people to uh, sure. invest? Yep. That's not why you'd use it, though. I mean, you use it so you can have a credit, unaccredited US investors. It, but it allows... Get it does. Yep. That as yep. Well. Yep. Okay. well. What do you think of the new uh, task force, SEC task force, created uh, by like the top two uh, VCs and Cooley and some people? And this this one, the cyber unit. And there's two of them. So one was an enforcement unit, uh, and then there's this task force that's working on distributed ledger technology. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, because from what I heard, like. Uh, with one of the lawyers who did that task force, and they said that even if the SEC may have a probationary period where they see how the people are actually using the platform before considering it as a utility. All right. Well, that'd be good. You know, I'm encouraged by what the SEC is doing. Like I say, I, I know the, the libertarian element that's doing these deals you know, it's kind of amazing, the attitudes. It's like, why should we be regulated? What's this regulation stuff? You know, the market should be free like a bird. But, you know, it could be so much worse. The SEC has been restrained. I keep telling people that. And nobody believes me, but they have. They've really only been going after the abusive ones where people lost money or the system got hacked or didn't have an AML policy. And now they got a task force that's about to try to enable this system of raising money, uh, I'm all for it. I think the SEC is, is is doing the right thing. I think we've got a pretty, despite the rhetoric, because the rhetoric is not aimed at you. The rhetoric's aimed at the guys who are like really pushing the envelope and doing the abusive stuff. So despite that, I, I think we're going to get, you know, out of this SEC, some really good rules. You know, think back. I, I'm going to do my best not to get political, but Think back when the Jobs Act was enacted. It was a Republican House came up with it, and a Democratic Senate changed it so it wasn't as good. And then it was enacted. And by not as good, I mean it was more investor-friendly. And then President Obama signed it. And the SEC was just openly hostile to that act. Just hostile. You ought to have heard the, you should have heard the thing. You probably remember the things coming out of the mouths. In fact, they just sat on their heels. They wouldn't even enact regulations for years implementing those provisions, even though they were ordered to do so by Congress. They just, it just drug their feet. We didn't get any rules on, um, on reg, you know, reg CF. That's where you can do, uh, you know, up to a million dollars. of. It's, so it's reg CF. It's crowdfunding. 2012, we got the law. You know, four years later, we finally get regulations allowing people to do it. Um, and it was all around rhetoric, you know, the whole time saying, this is a bad law. You know, the head of the SEC just openly said she didn't believe in the law. She thought it was a mistake. It was going to cause a lot of people to lose a lot of money that should be protected. So the SEC was just openly hostile to these rules. Uh, now we got an SEC that is basically, look, they got a task for us to try to make this stuff happen. So the regulatory environment in Washington has changed so much for the better on this particular issue. And, and I know to a lot of people it seems like, like it's bad, but it's really not. They're being very accommodating, I think. That's my political comment for the night. That's all I'll say. One comment or question was, uh, so a lot of these are doing like private ICOs or like whatever the ex, uh, alternate ex, uh, exchanges. How will it actually work? Because the company doing ICO or whatever can't really control how it's exchanged. Yeah. Anybody can list it. And it can go to the hands of non-accredited. That's the big issue. You kind of put your, you know, you put your finger on the big issue that we all have. And I get that question every day. It's like, well, how 
how I can't control that. How do I keep for the better issue is am I in trouble if somebody takes my token and puts it on Binance? You know, why is that my problem? And I do believe that because we've had this, and this is not new if you think about it. It's just a new it's new wine, but it's an old bottle. The old bottle is well, what if you have private company stock and you let somebody go put that stock on an unregistered exchange? We've got plenty of lore around that. And generally, companies have an obligation, I think, to keep that from happening, and they can't shirk that. As many times when I, as company counsel, had to tell somebody, we're not going to respect that transfer. We're just not going to let you do it because we know you're violating securities laws and we don't want to be a party to it. So, I, and I can't find law that says they have to do that, probably, but that's what the standard was. I think where you get in trouble is if you help them do that. How do you help them? If you're helping them, if you're promoting it, if you're telling them, if you're, if you're really aggressively helping them get that security on that unregistered exchange, then I think the company does have some exposure. So that's what I'm really worried about. And I think almost every one of these ICOs, people understand they're going to end up on an exchange. They're going to have U.S. holders. Uh, and uh, we just live with that for now uh, because, you know, hopefully we're going to get some rules, some ATPs that will help us make that okay. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. So, question two questions. Number one, regarding Reg A. So, um, what's the major challenge to be for a company to be successful for the Reg A application process to be successful? As a practical matter, the major challenge for my clients is the cost. <coughs> it's cost and time, because it's cost and time, because it is a registration process. It is expensive requires a lot of documentation. And um, I guess just, just to be honest with you, I mean, the ones I'm seeing, companies have enough trouble just doing a Reg D disclosure, you know, just doing a PPM, just trying to think through their business model and think through all of the risks and, you know, the risk factors, uh, all the disclosures, all the representations. So the, the biggest problem is going to be you're going to have a lot of upfront cost in this. It's going to take, it's going to take a lot of time. And then... Four months. Yeah, it could, it could be longer, but you're looking at least that. And then, um, what if the offer? What if you don't sell any? What if the offering fails after all that? Now you can go out and test the waters, pretty sure. Uh, but still, um, that that's you know, like I say, Start Engine's doing all of their deals or a lot of their deals as Reg A plus. Uh, my clients haven't just haven't been that patient. <laughs> they just want to go to Reg D, Reg S. There's not a lot of your client doing the. No, we talk about it a lot, but once we get through, it's all involved. <laughs> we just kind of cut to the chase. Second part is that the tax tax planning. You mentioned tax planning is very important, and the earlier you showed slides, multiple blocks, the technology platform in U U.S., Common Island uh, ICO company, and the Singapore um, of foundation, and the, is this the, the best uh, structure for tax purpose? Um, yeah, it's one that, you know, this is not a tax-driven structure. This is a securities law-driven structure, right? Um, and I, But we can get a good tax result out of that structure. Uh, so the tax is not what drives these things. It's the securities law is what drives them. I mean, the reason we have the Singapore Foundation is really for securities purposes. Uh, and not just U.S. securities purposes, foreign securities purposes. No, it's not. I, I put that in. No, that. Yeah, that is. Because the reason I have that in this particular structure, um, I do that because. Um, so, so in this one, we got a foundation which doesn't issue shares, right? And there's no real owners to it, theoretically. So I need the money to go into a company that, I wanted to go into a company that, that does have shares and owners and a management structure that I understand. Uh, and that's why, I, let's just say Cayman and a tax haven. I want it to be in a tax haven that actually has some functionality to it so we can um, justify uh, the receipt of the money over there. And then we're gonna pay you know a payment back here to offset our, our deductions. Then the rest of it, um, if we're lucky, you know, we'll get a relatively low rate of tax on, the guilty rate of tax. I, if you're really interested in this, I have an extensive memo that goes 
through it. But it, it would take a while to explain how we get there, but this is where I've ended up a lot of times on these. Not so bad. I mean, would we get another five grand for a gaming company? You know, uh, you, I have been doing these lately without the Singapore Foundation at all. But the problem my Cayman lawyers tell me is that it's the AML is harder. That's what I've heard. Because from my standpoint, this is just one big thing offshore. I don't care as a US matter if that's one or two corporations. I let the foreign lawyers deal with that piece. Uh, and my question is, uh, for Coinbase, now a lot of uh, US citizens buy coins from Coinbase, right? So it's not fully regulated yet, or is because they have both a utility token or security token, right? In Coinbase, that is changed in California, right? Coinbase, no, Coinbase, it, it just, uh, it, it only has cryptocurrency, I think, unless some of you correct me. In fact, it's only got three of them that I know of, right? Bitcoin, Ethereum, and Litecoin. What? Oh, and Bitcoin Cash, that's right, whatever that is. Um, I'm still trying to figure that out myself, that fork thing. So what security are you talking about? So it's very safe for a U.S. citizen to buy the, uh, let's say, Bitcoin uh, U.S. dollar, right? But not the, all the tokens on the uh, Coinbase. Oh. Well, <laughs> yeah. Uh, is this a gray area or? It, You're wondering about the safety and security of, uh, of the exchanges themselves. Is that it? Uh, I feel pretty good about Coinbase myself, but okay. uh, I know they, are you worried about hacking? Is that it? Uh, I mean, is that uh, totally safe to, to buy everything? In well, Coinbase? keep in mind, I'm a legal, I'm a legal person, not a technical person, so I'll let one of these smart engineers here tell you how vulnerable any of these sites are. Uh, but as a legal matter, there's, it's not illegal to hold an account at Coinbase. Nothing at all wrong with that, you know, as long as you've, you know, report it on your tax returns. And by the way, Coinbase makes that really easy now, right? They give you a spreadsheet that shows all your transactions throughout the year. They should know what your basis is. So they make it super easy to comply. So yeah, I like it. I represent one of their competitors, so I shouldn't say that, but you know, I kind of like it. Thank you. Okay, you got two uh, industrial related type questions. One, when you say you have to be uh, accredited, I know that. But once you get that money to get accredited, what do you need to do next to get accredited? What do you do next to get accredited? Well, After it's, you have the money. What's that? After you have the million dollars. That's it. It's just a net worth or a net income test. So if you have a million dollars of, of net worth excluding your residence, you are accredited. And how would you lose that? I mean, if you spent some of that, you'd have under a million. No, it's net worth. Net Hopefully, worth. You, unless you go gamble it away unless in Las Vegas or house. something. Unless you buy a house. Yeah, you could, you know, you raise a good point because sometimes people will flip in and out of a credit and we'll do, um, we'll do, um, we'll do an offering and then that person will come back and we'll want to do a follow-on offering and I got to tell the client, well, you got to get another set of investor suitability questionnaires because who knows, you might have bought a house in the meantime. It's no longer accredited. Okay, the other question was on one of these unregulated exchanges. Buy something that shouldn't be sold. One of these things people put up there. What does that mean at that point? I don't know. Uh, that's the thing. I don't know. That's. I'm worried about the company's exposure for participating in that. That's my concern, and I haven't really put my finger on how exactly that's going to get them. <laughs> and we talk with lawyers about this all the time. So the next time I do this presentation, certainly the law and practice will have evolved. So we'll have an answer to that. I'm going to put you in the position of the SEC. If I walk into a casino, I go get a bunch of tokens. And I go to the craps table. What's the Howey law? How does the Howey law not apply? How we rule? Well, I think in that case, uh, you're, um, you're not relying on the managerial efforts of somebody else to make money.
Yeah, I, I know these. Well, maybe I, I, I guess um, you think about it. I mean, I'll, I'll, I'll do you one better. Why is it I can go into a casino and throw my money away on something where we know I'm going to lose, right? I mean, those casinos didn't build themselves, right? We know I'm going to lose. That's okay. The law says that's fine. I don't have to fill out a suitability questionnaire. I don't have to pass a test. You know, I don't have to bring my investor representative. But I can't go buy stock or tokens in a company without. I might, well, maybe that could be. Maybe that's why these tokens will do well because they're, you know, the proceeds will be taxable. I, um, one question um, regarding the light tokens transfers. Um, you said there was a regulation that passed the 1st of January where is it going forward any light token is not acceptable, but before that they are? Is that possible? Yeah, 1031, you mean? The 1031 rules on like kind exchanges? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, um, so one day last summer, I was sitting at my desk, minding my own business, the phone rang, and it said Wall Street Journal, and I said, oh, gee, my subscription must be up. So I answered it, turned out to be a reporter, and said, um, hey, uh, you've written about this topic. Do you think if you trade Bitcoin for Ethereum, that's a tax-free 1031 transaction? And I said, yeah, why not? Next thing I know, it shows up in print. Next thing I know, I got people calling me saying, you're the guy who says we can do this tax-free. <laughs> <laughs> and fortunately, pretty much everybody else, pretty much you know, most people agreed with me. You know, with a lot more analysis than I put into it, admittedly. Um, and Congress must have heard about this because in this latest tax bill, it's right in the law, it says the only thing that qualifies for 1031 now is real estate as of this year. As of this year, so my past tax return, I can go correct it, right? You're good for 2017, I think. Uh, okay. Now, there's no ruling out there that says so. Jeez. There's no case, there's no judge, there's no RF, there's just me. But uh, you know, I think you're. I think you're okay. Okay. No, appreciate it. Thanks. Great. Another question. One more. Um, say there's a successful ICO company, U.S. That's SEC approved. Um, say they want to fund another company by, by providing some some of their tokens. Is that? Is there some kind of other restrictions there that maybe? Not that, sure, I follow. So. There's a lot of successful ICOs that have a bunch of tokens, and some of them are going to expand and promote themselves by providing some of those tokens to other companies. Um, could be an ICO or could be a, a small mom and pop shop. So, like, here's a million dollars worth of these tokens to help promote my product. Um, it's just. It's sort of like a payment, but um, I guess since they're, they're providing tokens, there's probably some more law around it, I'm thinking. I don't know. Just everything I talked about. You know, something like that, the biggest issue I'd worry about is just disclosure issues. Um, you know, because you got to make sure your investors get all material facts in this. That sounds kind of complicated. That, by the way, is sort of my litmus test when I see these deals. If I don't understand it pretty immediately, I really worry about it. You know, because how are you going to explain this to investors? Isn't someone going to come back and say, oh, that's not what I thought I bought? Because I've been hearing that my whole career from investors and stuff a lot simpler than this. So just all the rules we talked about, disclosure, and that one sounds like it might be an F, might be a consumer FTC sort of issue as well. Okay, great. I'll give you a better one than that. So here's the plan, how people think they're going to do public offerings. It's probably, we're probably out of time, but you're pretty knowledgeable audience, so you'll appreciate this. So right now, if you want to do a public file or a registration statement, an S1 for your stock, and list your, list your security on an exchange, you're going to have to have an escrow with a bank or a financial institution. All right, well, no bank is going to touch an ICO. They just won't. So you're pretty much practically prohibited from doing it. Unless you can have a token that is basically tied to a share of stock. Right, so then you do the you go public with the stock, and you have the token based on the public offering of the stock. There's a sale of the stock; the proceeds from the stock can go into a bank account. 
I know it sounds complicated. That's why I'm saying it's just it's just not going to happen. We're not going to get public offerings of of tokens. I don't think. Okay, one more question over here, or two more. One of the cool things about ICOs is that you don't have to give up equity in your company. That's right. So if you have to pay a bunch of money in legal fees to do, your ICO, do you have any recommendations on are there ways to go about raising that money? Maybe through a pre something like that that you see your clients doing. Well, yeah, we all do a pre-sale, for sure. But you know what the pre-sale is a SAFT? That's a simple agreement for future tokens. Uh, but that's because we're anticipating we actually are going to do the token sale. You're saying, is there an alternative to an ICO where you don't have to give up equity? Is that the question? Yeah. I mean, there is. It's called crowdfunding. And in fact, an ICO, to me, looks like crowdfunding on steroids. Because it's almost the exact same thing. right? Crowdfunding, you're taking in money. You're pre-selling a product. If you get a product at all, maybe they don't even get the product. Uh, it's like an advance, um, that, and you're giving up no equity. You're kind of doing the same thing with a token. But other than that, no. And by the way, when you go talk to VCs about this. A lot of them will say, just, just do it the old-fashioned way. Just sell equity. You know, you don't need these tokens. By the way, on that term sheets now, I just saw one today from one of the big VCs uh, in Menlo Park. And there's a clause in every term sheet now for financing that says, if you tokenize, you gotta give us some of those tokens. That's popping up in term sheets. So the venture community has figured this out. <laughs> when you say crowdfunding, do you mean Kickstarter or something like that? Yeah, Kickstarter, Indiegogo, those sorts of things. Okay, thank you. Seems kind of cute now, doesn't it? At the time, it was all the rage. Now with ICOs, it's like crowdfunding. What's that? All right, uh, we've got time for maybe one last question. You got a good question? Thank you, Royce. Great uh, presentation. So uh, you mentioned that there are some like a trigger for like if you. Uh, make transactions on Coinbase and puts 20,000 and it will trigger the tax event. Uh, is that based on a transaction or based on a balance? It's transaction and it doesn't trigger a tax event. It, it means that it, so the Coinbase has turned over to the IRS transactions, any transaction more than $20,000 is what I'm saying. So that means the IRS computer is, you know, knows that if you did more than $20,000 of transactions, that means they're going to be coming for you eventually. It doesn't matter, like, if the balance is over. If you haven't made uh, the transaction. Let me double check. I believe it was per transaction. Aggregate for the year. Uh, let me look, take a look. With at least the equivalent of $20,000 in any one transaction in any one year. Oh, I'm sorry, any one transaction type. Yeah, that's right. So that would be aggregate for the year. Okay, well, thank you very much.